Today is Sunday, December 3rd, and welcome to my last show of 2023. Do me a favor, let me know where you're joining me from. So click on uh, your comment section and let me know whatever platform you're looking at, because we are all across the world. And I want to know what you have, uh, what you sell, and whereabouts in the world. How's that? So I want to start off, if you're a U.S.-based uh, retailer, you want to stop and pay some attention to what I'm about to share with you today. Um, because you may have money waiting. What? Money? Wait, did you say money? Yes, that is it. Because there is $5 billion in refunds to U.S. Visa and MasterCard merchants based on interchange fees paid January 1st, 2004 to January 25th, 2019. And the key is that you are already part of the pool, but don't sort your, your, um, your information here. If you get one of these then you should pay attention because you may be eligible. I have to put the right language in here because you may be eligible to be part of it. So look at this. And all I want you to do is look for this envelope and open it, scan the QR code, review your data and submit the information. It's going to take you five minutes. And I don't have all the information. I'll have another um I'll have another video. I'll explain this more. But in the meantime, all I want you to take away if you're a US-based merchant. Just follow when you see this envelope. I just want you to follow the information and claim your money. All right, there you go. I am not a lawyer, so if there's any questions about it, uh, you can put them in comments and we'll get those answered as well. Uh, so where are you joining me from? That's important to know today. So let me know. Uh, Joanne, all right. <laughs> Good morning from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. That's great to hear. Thanks very much. Who else have we got? You know, we're uh, coming into the last uh, quarter, the last sprint, as it were, for business. And I know that a lot of you had some questions here. I'll try to get to as many as possible. The most important thing uh, I want to make sure you get also is that tonight in the um, uh, newsletter, I'm going to be revealing our uh, winners of our holiday windows contest. And I've also written a brand new post about how to make yours exceptional. So do me a favor and uh, look at that. Good morning, Stacy. Glad you're here this morning. Stacy was the one that convinced me to be in their holiday windows recently. So you probably saw that video on um, on my Facebook page. And if you didn't see that on uh, LinkedIn or YouTube, well, you can search for it. There you go. All right, so let's get to the mic. asks, how long should you keep item in stock before marking them down? That's a question only you can ask. <clears throat> the, quest the goal is for all your merchandise to turn twice a year. So if you have something you haven't marked down in a year, certainly that's something to look at. But more importantly, uh, merchandise doesn't get merchandise doesn't get better with age. It's like milk. It starts to spoil. It starts to stink, and there's no way you can get around that. You know, I always say you put a display up for a couple weeks. If somebody buys off it, great. If they don't, you move it to another part in the store. If that doesn't work, maybe another part of the store, and then you have to realize I bought a, a dud. So I got to figure out what we're going to do to get rid of it. Sometimes you can incent people to sell more of them so that you don't have to do the markdown. You know the uh, associates get the money. You don't have to take the loss that they like it. You'll like it. That's certainly possible. But in the end, I want you to just be thinking about what makes sense for you. I would tend to think that if I ordered 24 and there's still all 24 here, um, in, uh, you know, two or three months later, then I've got a problem and I need to find ways to get around it. So don't hold on to them, hoping it will come back. I actually walked into an auto parts, uh, store one time and then these pegboards, and um, there were, you know, things that were in uh, cello packs that were supposed to be clear and they were maybe this color. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, you need to mark this stuff and get down, get rid of it or put it on eBay or whatever. And uh, he goes, no, you know, it could still come back. It's like, dude, no one's coming in here for that tiny little part uh, from 15 years ago. Now, if you bought your stock, obviously for Easter or something, and it's, February 1st, that's a little different for, for most of you. That's why I always recommend having an up-to-date POS system that can date your merchandise. And it will tell you, you need to mark this down because it can learn your historical averages. And as generative AI helps us with all of these matters, it will make it even better for you to go through as long as you have those data points and you have a POS system that's not just a cash register you bought at Costco for 99 bucks because you're cheap, but you have a full figured uh reporting system, it really will make a big difference. 
Uh, Studio 24E, I guess that's a person, uh, asks, how do you handle unruly kids when parents are no longer taking responsibility, even after you've kindly dropped subtle hints? There's nothing subtle about it. I wrote a whole blog about this uh, many, many years ago. Uh, there you go. But the key to all of it is you should give them something to do. So you have pink and yellow and blue bubble wrap you can give to them. You can have puzzles. You can have a, 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 a scavenger hunt. There's a lot of things, but you have to be proactive and trying to drop subtle hints is never the way to do it. And if it's really that big a deal, then you have to ask yourself, um, you know, maybe you should be looking at getting more um, displays that are higher up and some other things as well as, as that. Lynn asked me, do giveaways work on social media? Well, I think they can. I mean, you know, who doesn't like free? The challenge on a social media free giveaway is you're actually giving that traffic to your, uh, to Facebook or TikTok or whoever, right? You're building their audience. You're not building your own. So if you want to be doing giveaways, I would certainly make it so that they had to give you at least information. But I think a lot of us, uh, content providers, something I struggle with is, you know, a lot of times we give a lot of dog food out for dogs. Of course, they're going to eat it. Of course, they're going to want it. Yeah, this is great. Wonderful. But what you really want is the people that buy the dog food. You really want the people that are willing to commit to buy your merchandise. They're the ones that you want not just being able to just give more free stuff out to unknown people. So always making sure you capture their names as best as possible. Top fan, Alice says, what's the best approach to take when neighboring businesses start duplicating your lines, copying ideas? We must go through this uh, probably every six months. I get people feel frustrated. Of course, I get all of that. Suddenly new shops are opening and duplicating closely what we've been doing for eight years. Uh, I get it, Alice. And unfortunately, that's just the way life has always been in retail. I mean, you know, uh, there are several people along here that'll tell you, you just need to get out of those businesses. You just need to change your lines up. You need to, you know, threaten your suppliers. But if you're that small, you probably don't have any recourse. It's not like you're Target and you say, um, if you do this again, we'll take it out of all of our stores. You're pretty much a small fish and they know it. So I would look at it and turn its head and say, what can you do? better and keep reinventing yourself because they're not the problem. If they are going to their store, uh, exactly, Roger, thank you. Um, the hope is that you're going to go through and you're magically going to shut them down. Well, that's not going to happen. And trying to work towards that end is just putting yourself in a, a state of intention of hate. And, you know, those bastards are trying to do something to me. And uh, I probably shouldn't have said that word because now Facebook will probably clamp down on the algorithm. But uh, the whole idea that you can go through and stop them, Alice, is just not going to happen. I've told that story many times about um, various people who have carried merchandise and someone wants to shut them down with a landlord and all these things. And in the end, the landlord's not going to do it and the line's not going to do it. So either drop the line and find something else or do something different. But it's yours to fight for. And quite simply, you have more competitors online than you'll ever have in the same store. So uh, yeah, it's not easy. You, you know, do you know how many people take my stuff and purport it as their own or they just copy it and then they make it known? There's a million ways. And if I focus my whole life on that, um, I'm going to be pretty miserable and no one's going to want to work with me. Instead, I want to just say, well, move along. I just want to focus on the people who uh, see the value in what I train and are willing to pay for it. And I hope that works for you, Alice. It's never going to be a on off switch that you can just flip, but it is something an on off switch. You can switch in here in your heart and just move along. Flora says with the growing popularity of Tamu and shine, is it in bad taste? I reference them in my social media posts. I want to teach my customers about their bad practices and cheap products, but I don't want to come across as bitter or negative. Flora, you already have. Uh, any advice on hand to handle it? You know, the reality is you could certainly compare and contrast on a social media post. But um, why are you giving, why are you advertising Temu and Shine? The people who want it are probably not your customer. And if you think they are, now you're going to be going again, head to head, trying to say, oh, they're crap. Look at the way that they make their products and look at how awful... And in the end, what are you going to do with that? I mean, who's going to want to come to that business that keeps saying that? In the end, I would say you could certainly compare and contrast. You know, we ordered two T-shirts, one that we carry and one 
that uh, this other one that starts with a T carries. And take a look at the difference when you're looking at garments, what might look good online doesn't really hold up well and you could wash them both twice or something and look at the difference. You could do that. Um, but again, um, the people that are buying a shirt, you know, uh, this shirt costs a lot more than you'd get from those places. And it's a style I want and I, I like it and all that. If you were trying to compare this to something like that, I'd be like, what are you doing? Um, so if you're, you know, if your market is teenagers and very young people who shop a lot on that for that, well then great, but it's still going to be compare and contrast. And my guess is that you're going after something you think that you can change your opinion on. And my guess is no, what you'll probably do is validate people who buy from you. But, you know, people who understand that a flannel, a men's flannel shirt for $14.99 is not worth the, the price because invariably you wash it once and it's going to fit a chihuahua because uh, we've all been there once in our life. Until someone does that, then they keep thinking, look what the great deal is. And ultimately, uh, what we're hearing over and over in is since the pandemic, people want quality and they want things that last and they want things that are a little bit more bespoke at the same time. People are are flooding to Shine and Timu and all the other gamification ways that they can to get you to buy stuff that is really um, not the same quality. So without going too far on that, uh, let's keep going. Graham says, what's a good ratio of items on floor to in storage be? For example, 75% of items actually on the floor and 20% in the stock room. I sell home decor items and non-furniture. Well, Graham, I've always said, you know, if it's in the stock room, no one can buy it. So, um, you know, you go into a Home Depot or Lowe's and they don't have a warehouse pretty much. It's all stacked above so that if they have it, they know it's marked and it's up in a box up there so that they can display it. You're seeing more and more retailers who are trying to use the um, selling space to be able to hold overstock. But again, it's up to you on your store. Um, if 25% of it is out of code or it's a new season or something like that that's one thing but um i'm always a big believer of the more i can put out there the better you know i've told silverview the story of when i was selling cowboy boots and in those days back in uh back in those days you would have uh, uh the boot store pretty much had a set of oh maybe five um, shelves that went up the wall and then they had one or two pairs of a boot and then you would go and you'd ask and you would get it from the back and come out well the stock rooms were huge and they're all in these cardboard boxes and god forbid somebody doesn't know the model number read it right they missed the sale so i said well, why don't we do this and we literally went from the floor to the ceiling there were 14 uh shelves and all that went literally from the floor to the 10 feet up which made it challenging to get those top boots However, when people walk by, I was like, oh my God, they must have everything. And so you could also instantly see what you had and you weren't overselling from the floor. So I think there's a lot of reasons why it's good. But again, that's going to come up to you and your space limitations. And I would say just having more stuff on the floor doesn't work unless you put it into a display, unless you made it into a, a window, unless your employees know how to upsell and add on. Because just putting more choice out there probably doesn't make you more money making the right choice to focal to get three items instead of one. That's where the sweet part of retail is. So I hope that helps. Hey, Margo, glad you're here for, I heard you got like seven inches of snow up there. Keep it up there, please. Uh, Luis, hey, glad you're here from Portugal. That's great. And Maggie's glad you're here from big, from Bear Lake. I'm from Los Angeles, big Bear Lake. No. And we also have John here from Huntsville. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask them right this minute because I'm just about at the end of my time here. I wanted to get to 15 minutes because I'm sure most of you are going to open your stores today and uh, and get going. Uh, Dory says, I've been given an unrealistic sales goal for December. My staff is short and totally new. My last crew was trained with sales recs, but jumped ship before Black Friday weekend. What can I do to excel at the group and stand a chance to achieve a goal? Well, Dory... Um, um, first off, I did check your, uh, you are not a SalesRx user. So let's make sure we aren't saying you've read my articles and say that SalesRx. SalesRx is a behavior training program. We go through and show everybody exactly how to engage a stranger, discover the shopper, compare and contrast, add on and get the sale and follow up. And that's about a four to six month program. So reading my stuff is nowhere near the same as my uh, online training. 
Um, I will tell you a quick story that when I was uh, first starting out, I was given a, a, a goal. I was a new manager in a store and the, um, uh, the owners had given me this goal that was, I don't know, 15% over the previous year. And uh, it was one of the highest in the in the chain. And that time we only had 11 stores, ultimately had 54, but only had 11. And um, and so I'd be given the new managership and I changed things around. Of course, I made them actually show up for work and do things. And I had um, one young woman who flirted too much with the guys. She was about 17. Uh, I had a guy who uh, didn't really speak English. Uh, I had three part-timers I'd never seen. And I had... A host of other people and they just didn't like me they didn't like the fact that a new manager came in made him work held them accountable to sales goals and so i uh, came back from the bank one day and two of them were having sex in the stock room yay good stuff and so we got ready for this big goal which was in august and it was a preferred customer sale and uh it was only from taking those old sheets some of you will remember you had to have a uh a sheet of labels you printed them at, at that time would have been Kinko's or now it's FedEx and you would print those off and then you would peel them and put them on to envelopes. And they, this store had, uh, I think like 10,000. It was great. So I'm like, wonderful. And the day I went back there to find the master, they had actually shredded it. So they hated me. So I go up to the owner and I said, um, there's no way I can hit this goal. Uh, you need to lower it. There's no way. And he goes, um, then I guess we put the wrong guy in the place. I'm like what? And he goes, I'm not lowering your goal. I'm like, damn it. So I uh, I got in my car and it was about an hour north of my house. So I'm driving home down Los Angeles to 405. And I'm just like, this is really ridiculous. All I've done for these people. And I'm just there. And then as I crossed the, the, the mountain, I just decided, well, what if I could? What if I could do this? What would I do? So I stopped by the store and I ended up... Uh, the guy who I didn't think spoke English. Oh, actually he speaks three in, three languages. You just didn't spend any time with the guy and he became my right-hand guy, Marcel. He was awesome. Uh, the young woman who flirted too much. Well, I told her you have to tone it down a little bit. And I got rid of a couple other people and the rest of them uh, quit. So I had four people on my crew for a store that should have had 11. That was back when we actually believed in staffing stores instead of we can get by. And, uh, and we had... And I hired one person and we had a lights out August. And in fact, I got the highest increase of sales that month. Now, the reason I tell that story, Dory, is it's your attitude. Because if you start off with, it's unrealistic, there's no way I can do it, you win. <laughs> but instead, if you figure your mind and say, well, what if I could? It's a lot more fun place. And even if uh, it doesn't work, at least you're, every day you're thinking, what if I could? What if I could? How could I do it? And that's that's the key. You know, accelerating a group now where our, uh, we're three. We're basically three weeks away from Christmas. Uh, I think the main thing is to make them feel supported and that they can do it, and make sure that you aren't um, nagging them and making them feel bad, and trying to make it fun. Uh, anyone else have any ideas? You could type them in here in comments. But I think the main thing that I want all of you to be thinking of as we come into uh, to the holiday season is it's going to be a once in probably twenty years um, great holiday season for an awful lot of reasons, as much as the world wants to put us into recession and no one's buying, et cetera, consumers are out. They are buying not only what's on sale, but also the basics and also the luxury items. And the closer we get to the holiday uh, itself, the more men will be out shopping for themselves and for their boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, kid, business partner, you name it. And it's yours to lose if they walk in the door and they're met with, um, you know, Oh, uh, if you have any questions, go over there. The time now is to make sure that your intention is set up, that I'm going to have the best holiday season yet, and that you have fun with it. And maybe you end up buying your a crew a pizza next Saturday because it's bound to be crazy, or surprise them with lottery tickets as you just walk through the store one day, or anything to surprise and delight them so they'll surprise and delight your crew. And the other thing I want to make sure, that, again, as I started off, is if you see this or when you see this, if you're in the U.S. and you get one of these in the mail, make sure you tell everyone you need to see that because um, you might be able to be part of that pool. And I want to make sure that you have all that information. So with that in mind, 
uh, it's been great to have you here. And, oh, I love that, Nancy. I, that's a great way for me to, to go off. Yes, they're out in record numbers. Never had such a good start to the holiday season. Exactly. So, again, take your intention. Make sure that it's always going to be, how can I do better? What if we can do it? And uh, thanks for joining me this whole year. This is my last live video of uh, 2023. And I appreciate you all being here. And make sure that you're uh, telling your friends that, you are the reason why we are successful because if you make other people feel they matter, they reward you with what you want to feel, which is to feel that you matter too. I'm Bob Fibbs, the Retail Doc. Thanks so much. Bye.